a very nice uh, first lecture a couple days ago, and my student Marisa Swindell, she's a nutritional program student, she did really nice basic education course <laughs> that prepare That's us great. to listen to you. And I uh, remind everybody while people collect, we collect in participants, on Monday will be our final small lecture, 30 minutes and questions, and we will be discussing in details uh, myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue, symptoms, signs, and what we can do from nutrition point of view, how we control our these symptoms. And I, I guess we're going to start, and I'm going to start with introduction. You will see on the screen Ms. Hailey Pomeroy, and she's a best-selling author, leading health and wellness entrepreneur, she is a celebrity nutritionist and motivational speaker. Uh, she published many books. I have all, uh, many of them on my desk. And she joined our practice, Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, and she joined uh, Integrative Medicine Department, and she also play, uh, doing her studies and doctoral degree, planning to do doctoral degree at Nova Southeastern University. So we enjoy uh, her as a new member of our group and we're giving her platform to share with us her experience with the food uh, as the biggest expert. I hope I did what I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's just great to be here. I really appreciate it. And I think it's, um, you know, a wonderful opportunity for all of us to kind of come together, put our minds together and, and talk about things that are affecting a lot of people right now, and especially individuals that are dealing with um, MECSF. So it looks like we have a, a really great group. Um, I was looking on here and when I'm, when I'm, you know, I just want to talk to you guys about a couple of different things. I've been in clinical practice for over 25 years, and um, I also lead very large communities through different kinds of health journeys. I own integrative healthcare clinics in the United States and travel out of the country as well to help individuals find the care that they need. So one thing you guys are going to notice about me is, you know, I'm super accessible. If you have questions, you know, post them in the chat. Um, we'll get to them. We'll go through kind of a Q&A session as well, but I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit and, and, and in this comfortable setting, a little bit about inflammation in the body and a little bit about certain things that can promote inflammation in a negative way. And then things that can promote natural anti-inflammatory uh, processes in the body, as well as foods that in general um, can help maybe calm an inflammatory cycle that a person is currently in. So that's kind of where we want to go today. But again, if you guys have questions, please post them in the chat. I'll be peeking at that as well as, um, you know, at the end, we'll dedicate that. So, so you, you guys can ask me anything, no questions are uh, too big or too small. And we'll kind of go over that. I, I just want to give you a teeny background on myself. Um, I am an individual that thrives with an autoimmune disorder. I was diagnosed with ITP at 19. ITP is an a, a autoimmune disorder that affects the uh, platelets primarily. And because of that, I've kind of spent my life very um, cognizant or aware of what does or doesn't affect my immune system and the inflammatory processes in my body. I actually... Um, had the uh, my first degree is in agriculture and animal sciences and I learned a lot about soil sciences you know growing foods I raised my own cattle um, and was pl actually planning on going to vet school but because of my own health concerns and significant challenges I needed to change my um my, my professional trajectory and also my whole life based on needing to learn how to biohack my own body and get everything kind of back under control. So I myself found uh, myself on a lot of anti-rejection drugs. I was on Imurin, Salsep, Mepron, um, 60 to 80 milligrams of prednisone every day and ended up in a crisis situation where I lost part of the function of my right kidney. Um, I wasn't tolerating the meds very well. And I turned to my kitchen biochemistry 
uh, micronutrient supplements to completely change my health. I, I'm excited to say that I have been 20 plus years um, using food as my primary form of medicine, significant uh, herbs, IV nutritionals, you name it, I've pretty much tried it. So, you know, like I said, feel free to ask me anything. I just want to talk a little bit about inflammation in general. When we talk about inflammation and we, you know, we, we want to have an inflammatory process in our body so that um, it can promote healing. But inflammation is typically a feedback loop, right? If we injure ourselves, let's say we're hammering a nail into the wall and we hit our, our thumb. Um, inflammation stimulates uh, rapid healing in, in a body that's recently injured or wounded. It creates swelling, right? It increases blood flow. Um, it increases uh, edema or, or that swelling, a, a hydration to that area to kind of bathe the area. But inflammation should be ideally in our body uh, created during it, situational, right? Something happens, you hammer your thumb and it should be quick acting and it should, the body should naturally clear that inflammation or inflammatory process through breath, through sweat, through uh, urination, through bowel movements, um, any, any aspect of elimination in the body, the body should have a response, create and promote healing, and then create a new homeostasis or come back into balance. Many people that deal with chronic inflama inflammation or inflammatory disorders, and definitely we look at um, MECSF as being one of those syndromes or nuances where the body's ability to regulate the inflammatory process is um, not in a state of homeostasis or balance. So a couple of things that we need to kind of think about with inflammation is that there's a huge hormonal component when we talk about inflammation. A lot of times when I say the word hormone, people think of estrogens, progesterones, testosterones, maybe even adrenal hormones like corticotrophic hormones, you know, things that um, are excreted with stress, maybe even hormones like epinephrine, you know, uh, things that make you feel good or make you feel happy. The inflammatory hormones, and there's a whole aspect of them, are regulated by a lot of the similar mechanisms that regulate all the other hormones in a feedback loop. So one thing to kind of think about is all of those feedback loops are nutrient dependent. So when we are in a status or a state of kind of chronic inflammation, the nutrients that we're currently partaking in are helping to support that homeostasis. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break that down a little bit more from what we see in the clinical setting. So we have individuals that come in with CSF, MECSF, and they're eating on all aspects, all ends of the spectrum of, of um, healthy or not healthy eating. Let's say we've got somebody that comes in and they're eating, you know, McDonald's three times a day and a lot of fried foods, you know, things that are maybe not really nutrient dense, and they're having a very significant symptom profile. We can also see people that come into the clinic that are doing, you know, everything quote unquote, right. They're eating tons of fruits, tons of vegetables, all organics. Um, when they consume meat products they're consuming it with a lot of raw vegetables to help with digestion. And they're still in an inflammatory process. So, you know, a lot of times in, in the industry of nutrition, people will say, you know, what can I do to reduce inflammation? What can I do to, uh, what can I avoid to, uh, inhibit being pro-inflammatory. And after being in clinical practice for many, many years, what I like to focus on is how to heal the process of regulating inflammation. And remember, everything's nutrient dependent. So in the cornerstone of your care, when you think about diagnostics, when you think about any aspect of treatment, nutrition needs to be at the forefront because it can promote homeostasis, but it can also shake up homeostasis that's in a disease state. I'm going to like explain that just, I'm going to say that one more time, because I think that's a really important thing for all of us together to grasp is if you're not in a state of ideal health and, and you get to decide that I always uh, take my clients through what we call a health wish list, right? Dream big. What do you want? Do you want to sleep deeper, not have pain when you wake up, wake up bright eyed and bushy tailed, have a strong libido, whatever it is that you desire in your health, we want to create a nutrient plan that can create 
a shakeup in what's currently going on to get you to the next level of health or homeostasis. So inflammation, again, that's a feedback loop. And for some reason, oops, I have company. And for some reason in the bodies, the, the, uh, the inflammation process with a person with uh, MECSF is stuck in a status of pro inflammatory hormones, overriding those that are anti-inflammatory. So what do we do with that? How do, how do we look at that? Um, in our space, we talk a lot about what we call confuse it to lose it. And a lot of people might think that has to do with weight loss in general. But when we use the word lose it, we mean lose the current symptom profile, lose the current diagnosis, maybe lose the current weight or lose the current status that the body's in that's not healthy or not feeling healthy or not ideal for your body. So the first thing when we're dealing with inflammation that I'd like to talk about is making sure that you do variety in your diet. We usually use what we call a two, two, three rotation, which means if you do something, whether it's, you know, the same kind of fruit, I'm going to talk about what fruits are, are typically can promote uh, a homeostasis when we're talking about inflammation. You don't do it more than two days a week two days a week. And then if you repeat it, no longer at the end of the week, more than three days a week. So let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, we want to focus on fruits. Things that are really anti-inflammatory are a lot of what they call the stone fruits. Stone fruits are anything with a pit. So think um, peaches, nectarines, mangoes, cherries, anything with a pit in it. Those are very nurturing to the adrenal glands, can help really create homeostasis or adaptability in stress hormones and in inflammatory hormones. So let's say you love black cherries like I do. Don't eat them five days a week. You want to rotate. You must do black cherries maybe one or two times a week. We want to rotate peaches maybe once or twice a week. And then if you have something that you're sure you're not reactive to, don't do it more than three days a week. So we usually pick through fruits and we do a two, two, three rotation. So let's just kind of recap here for a second. What I'm trying to do in the body, nutrient diversity in order to help create a new homeostasis with that feedback loop that's out of balance that we call inflammation. So I wanna talk first about things to do, right? So we wanna rotate your diet throughout the week. It's very important. We see this, and we just hear people talk about like the gut biome or the, the good bacteria in the body. You can change the gut biome in one to two days by changing the variety in your foods. What happens with a lot of us, especially if we don't feel well, is we start to eat the same thing over and over and over again. We'll talk about what to eliminate here in a second, but I really want to focus on things that can be pro you and pro getting your homeostasis or getting you a little bit better into detox um, and, and adaptability in the body. So the other thing that can be really important is making sure that you're doing the kinds of fruits and vegetables that are very easy to digest, but also provide a lot of nutrients. So what we call like very nutrient dense foods. I already mentioned the stone fruits. So write that down, make yourself a list. You know, you can Google stone fruits. We can give you a nice list. Um, I want you to pick those types of fruits that are going to be very nutrient dense and pack a punch. Don't get me wrong, you know, berries are amazing. Um, uh, you know, pineapple is a great thing. It's got a lot of pain, a lot of bromelain. You'll hear a lot about that from an anti-inflammatory perspective. But with um, MC, MECSF, we're not talking about a traumatic injury inflammation. We're talking about a constant chronic homeostasis where the body starts to normalize this um, status of inflammation. So we do feed our clients that are dealing with that chronic inflammatory syndrome very different than an individual that's maybe going through surgery or has just been recently injured. So, so I want you to keep that in mind um, as you're sharing nutritional advice that you get here today with other people. So think about the stone fruits and then let's focus for a second on what we call the root vegetables. So root vegetables are things like carrots, sweet potatoes, um, beets. I don't know if anybody is uh, excited about these foods yet, but those that are grown in the ground 
Um, and we want to try to go organic. Remember, in a soil setting, when something's grown into the ground, it filters the earth as it's being uh, as as it's adding all the nutrients to the tissue and the flesh of that vegetable. So if you can grow your own, they're actually root vegetables are very easy to grow in a home container, anything uh, that you can do, you know, right outside your front porch, they're very easy to grow, but they're one that's very uh, important to look at from an organic perspective. So root vegetables, things I've got, you know, we've got, we have a couple different soups. We call them, you know, inflammatory soups, anti-inflammatory soups, things of that nature. You'll notice that I have a lot of um, daikon dicon radishes in them, turnips, beets, carrots. Those types of things will help nurture those adrenal glands, which are the glands that secrete the hormones that are responsible for adaptive uh, behavior in the body. So let's take that concept here for a second. If you love baked sweet potatoes, like I do, I don't want you to have sweet baked sweet potatoes, you know, five or seven days a week, no more than two days a week um, would, would be something that you would add in. Another great thing, if you're dealing with, um, let me just add one quick thing too. You know, radishes are another root vegetable that are phenomenal. If you guys aren't using, there's, and there's a ton of different kinds of radishes now available, you know, watermelon radishes, um, you know, big, huge ones. I'll grate those. I'll add those into a coleslaw if I'm making something in nature. But if you could take your, what we call meal map or looking at what you're eating for the week, and you could say, look, I want to make sure that five days a week, I add in lots of stone fruits and I add in lots of root vegetables. This would help your body by nurturing with the micronutrients that help nurture your adaptability. And then by layering on that concept of confuse it to lose it, right, you're going to do what we call food rotation so that your body starts to shake things up a little bit and nurture the hormones with those phytonutrients or enzymes that are in those fruits and vegetables. They're going to nurture the hormones that help you with better adaptability. The other, um, I think when we talk about things to do, so you know, we do a lot of fun things in our community. We do what we call digestive reserve testing and also um, pH testing, where we look at how the body's kind of ecosystem, how we're hydrating, how we're utilizing our minerals. There's some really fun things that you can do that can be a little bit what we call, you know, kind of home assessments that can let you know if you need to add lemon or lime into your water. So remember, dilution is the solution for pollution. So with a lot of ME CSF individuals, the body can be inhibited or they're not a superhero or a super powerful detoxifier, meaning they don't eliminate toxins. Now there could be an original insult, like a heavy toxic exposure that pushed the body into this inflammatory state. But also all of us, I always say, if you plan on eating, breathing, drinking, sleeping, you know, um, for the rest of your life, you're going to be exposed to toxins every day and you're going to need to eliminate that. So hydrating is very important with a body that's in a chronic inflammatory state, but it's kind of hard to know, you know, some people, they say, you know, I drink a lot of water and it runs right through me. Other people say I drink a lot of water. And by the end of the day, I have, you know, my rings are tight. I have edema or swelling. I get the sock ring around my ankle. So how does the body hydrate really efficiently? I'm a huge proponent for spring water. Um, there's a lot of great waters out there, but um, you know, using something like a lemon or a lime can help the body uptake the water and do water exchange a little bit more efficiently. So if you aren't doing any kind of pH testing or looking at the body's ecosystem, I tell everybody to rotate between lemon and lime. And a great indicator is to see, you know, ring size or rings around the socks, at, at, meaning like where you get the indentations from where your socks are, to see what your body's saying it could use more efficiently. So you can either rotate that, you know, lemon one day, lime one day, or you could do three days of the same thing and see if you get any edema. If you do, you wanna make sure that you do the opposite beverage. Um, in our community, we do some really fun, you know, saliva, urine testing, see how the body's ecosystem and enzymes are um, helping with the minerals and helping hydrate. And, and I'm more than happy to throw any of those. They're just fun link things that you can do. So let's just recap for a minute about the things that I want to make sure that you do on a regular basis. 
I want you to confuse it to lose it. So we're trying to lose the inflammatory homeostasis where the body's in this chronic state of um, being pro-inflammatory, whether that's in the joints, in um, uh, the interstitial in the tissue, whether that is um, sometimes inflammation can cause a dysregulation in blood sugar, which means like a person can um, gain weight easily, or they can get what they call dysglycemic. So you feel, you know, the high highs and the low lows emotionally and adrenal and anxiety wise, when your blood sugar, is, sugar isn't stable, inflammation or the inflammatory hormones can play a huge role in that. I don't know if anybody identifies with that at all. Um, when I have any, uh, more than normal in inflammation in my body at this point. Now I can definitely feel, um, dysglycemic, which means like anxiety, edgy, a little bit off if my blood sugar isn't really stable. So I want you to think about a couple of these things. I want you to look at your holistic food eating in a week uh, view. So a lot of people will say, you know, today I did great or yesterday I did great. I want you to look at it. And what we do in our community is we take a list and we say, okay, you know, I'd love you to have three, four, five fruits every single day. And with that, how many are we going to rotate through? So how many peaches are we going to get in? How many nectarines? How many mangoes? How many cherries? Um, how many plums? How many of those stone fruits can we add in in a variety throughout the week? Then I want you to look at those root vegetables and I want you to think about where can I sneak in some radishes? Where can I sneak in some sweet potatoes? Where can I sneak in... Um, um, some carrots, those types of things, again, that are going to be really nurturing. Um, there are classic uh, things that we say from an inflammatory status, which is the more fruits and vegetable you can get in, the more alkaline in the body, the more stable the body will be from how it does a lot of mineral exchange and how um, certain hormone classes can work together. So lots and lots of fruits and vegetables in general, but our superpower fruits and vegetables, our superhero fruits and vegetables are gonna be those stone fruits and those root vegetables. You're gonna do the rotation, the food rotation. You wanna confuse it to lose it so we can get rid of that thing uh, that was, was now what's normal in our body that we don't want to be normal anymore. And that's that homeostasis of inflammation. So, um, Let's see, how are you guys doing over there? Anybody have any questions? Feel free to throw it in the chat at any time. We'll talk Q&A afterwards. Um, I'm just gonna peek in here, see if anybody has any questions so far. Okay, I wanna get to the things to avoid. Now, the nutrition world is a very interesting world. There are so many fads that come through. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed in the last 26 years is, um, going through and kind of vilifying certain types of foods, especially around weight gain and or inflammation and or blood sugar. And so you'll see a lot of people talk about things like lectins. You'll hear people talk about nightshades. Um, if anybody has any comments or, or um, you know, opinions about those, I would love to hear them. Um, but, but those are, are what we call phytonutrients that are part of, like lectin is part of a food. It can be part of the seed of a tomato. And it's gotten a lot of bad rap lately as far as being pro-inflammatory. But we wanna also look at like lectins are also in mushrooms and they're very anti-cancerous. The, 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 a lot of studies that are going on right now about uh, phytonutrients and mushrooms and cancer treatments specifically, one of the isolates or the things that they're finding that seems to be very powerful is a phytonutrient that's called lectins. So, you know, if you're one of those individuals that's just completely avoiding an entire food group, this is what we always look at in our community is if you have an issue with a food, whether it's a true allergy or a reaction or reactivity, we like to look at why the body isn't able to process that efficiently and see if, again, we can create that homeostasis so that you can get nutrients in a broad and variety, uh, varied uh, uh, manner. But the thing that is we know is definitely pro-inflammatory in all individuals, but especially in individuals that are having a difficult time flushing inflammation throughout the body, is things that aren't food uh, and shouldn't be called food in the first place, and things that have been modified pretty significantly and still maybe fall under that umbrella of food, but um, are hardly what they were intended to be. 
So let me start with things that are not food first. So I hope you guys like puppies, minor, minor uh, talking up a storm down there. Things that aren't foods are things like additives and preservatives, chemical compounds that were designed to, you know, uh, strengthen the um, hull of a battleship like tartarazine, um, yellow number five, things that are meant for paint, things that are uh, meant as an additive or a preservative to preserve a food or to create an addictive uh, secretion in the brain so that you want to crave those foods. So we know that our body's response to those kinds of chemicals is a pro-inflammatory response. That's that acute, like when I talked about um, hitting your hammer, you have an acute inflammatory response. When we're exposed to these additives, preservatives, some call them obesogens, some call them neurotoxins, there is an acute pro-inflammatory response that happens in our body. Thank God it does. So our body doesn't get you know, toxic or poisoned. And our body tries to quickly increase blood flow and promote secretion. When we're doing this on a regular basis, day after day after day, it puts a significant burden on the body. So I always say food is things that once came from the land, from the sky, um, from the ocean, and uh, wasn't formulated in a lab. So when we're dealing with chronic inflammation, we want to focus on nutrition, and nutrition should focus on real food. So as best as possible, if you can use real whole food and eliminate additives and preservatives, it will allow your body to have less chronic incidence of having a normal, healthy pro-inflammatory response, right? So let me just say that one more time. Every single time you're exposed to any of these additives and preservatives, your body naturally has an inflammatory response. We don't want to burden the body that's already in a struggling state with this constant bombardment of an inflammatory response. So we're going to eat food and we're going to let all that other stuff be left at the hardware store so that it can um, make chemicals and substances stronger. But the other couple things, and I'm going to pick, pick on three things today that we want to try to eliminate from our diet as best as possible are corn, wheat, and dairy. I want to talk a little bit about this is I'm going to bring my Aggie hat on here for a second, my agricultural hat. Wheat and corn both have, even in organic uh, sense, have been hybridized in order to um, withstand very uh, um, strong agricultural influence. So hailstorms, rainstorms, extreme drought, bugs, right? Uh, We've actually hybridized our corn and our wheat to the point where it can be um, it can be very resilient with a lot of chemical or pesticides or insecticide exposure, and we've done this by crossing uh, different. Uh, genetic components. And I'm not even talking about genetically modified foods. I'm talking about even organic foods that um, have been grown and, and raised in a way to be more resilient. The problem is, is that once it gets into our body, we have enzymes and we have hydration and we have what we call mastication or chewing our food, right? Think of that as like a big, huge hailstorm for that uh, wheat and that corn. We also are full of bugs. That's what gets our extracts, all of our nutrients out of our foods. And so we've made these two types of grains, wheat, wheat and corn, very, very difficult for the body to metabolize. Now there's a whole, you know, I'm in this space many years. There's a whole nother concept of, of celiac disease, of glutenization of our, um, our wheat and, and grains in general in the United States. There's what's called enrichment, you know, adding bioflavonoids bioflavin, excuse me, into a lot of our grains in the United States to make them even legal to sell as a food product. But if we, if we, if we take all of that, we just set it all of that aside, which, you know, a lot of it, I have a pretty strong opinion on, but if we take all that and we set it all aside and we just say, gosh, these are two grains that are really, really hard for our body to break down and extract nutrients from. If we have a bottle body that's struggling, I'm just going to leave that off the plate. So for example, 
if you're an athlete and you've injured yourself and you're in a cast, I'm going to take you out of the race until we get your body healed, right? So although I have you know strong opinions about other aspects of wheat and corn as far as being pro-inflammatory, promoting weight gain, all thing, things of that nature, if we can just say that it's very hard on the body and we can leave out things that are very hard and put in things that are very easy, we can see that that would be not a good thing to have when we're in an inflammatory state. I'm going to harp on one last thing, and then I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to ask me anything. Um, I'm going to go after dairy here for a second. And I know we love our cheeses and we love our whipped cream. And we have some great dairy alternative things because I'm a creamy, comforty food kind of gal myself. Um, but the issue with dairy is what you're being given in a, in a in a commercial environment has again been homogenized. There's a lot of processing that happens that affects the bugs. It is also what's called a glycoprotein. So it's got a sugar and a protein in combination together, which can be a catalyst for inflammation or, or uh, CKs or uh, autolase, um, certain inflammatory uh, C-reactive proteins, certain inflammatory markers that are already kind of going on in the body. So again, it's not something that's going to help us get healthy. And as, and as a matter of fact, it can promote an already inflammatory state. We see this a lot of times if you're ever sick and you maybe want some ice cream or you've got a cough or your kids are sick and they get real phlegmy and real snotty. When you're already in an inflammatory state, dairy is a catalyst to increase inflammation, especially in the mucosal lining. So the nose, the mouth, all the way down the GI tract, um, it just is like adding lighter fluid to a fire that's a little out of control already. So those are the things that I'm going to kind of, I always like to start with the, the what to do and end with what not to do, because we're just going to leave those things off our plate, the three that we just talked about, because we're going to be eating so many amazing and healthier other things that are going to nurture our bodies and push us, push us, push us towards a new homeostasis every day that gets us healthier and healthier. So, all right, guys, that's what I wanted to make sure that you knew about inflammation. And I am going to now see if I can figure out how to answer some questions. Thank you, Haile. It was very good. <laughs> A lot of information. I hope we on Monday going to cover again some pro some. Uh, ideas uh, in details. I have a one question for now. What is the two two five plan? Is it two days on off a food item and two days off? So it's on and off uh, food item. Right. So a lot of times you hear with food allergies, with inflammation, with any kind of a chronic disorder, we talk a lot about food rotation, or a lot of people in the industry talk about food rotation. What we do as a community in when we're first trying to kind of shake things up is we do what we call a two, two, three rotation. So the first two days we focus on a lot of high glycemic fruits. So things like mangoes, peaches, you know, a lot of the sweet sweets. We usually uh, combine those with a complex carb, like a, like an oatmeal or brown rice. So we elevate the glycemic or the sugar, the natural sugar value for a couple of days. And so let's say that's like Monday, Tuesday, right? And then Wednesday, Thursday, we come in and we do a lot of the green alkaline vegetables and a lot of lean proteins. So maybe we do, you know, spinach and asparagus. We do um, broccoli. Maybe we uh, do like a beef and cabbage soup with some leeks or something of that nature. And then the last three days of the week, what we'll focus on is a lot of the healthy fats. So we'll do a lot of avocado, coconut, raw nuts and seeds. Make sure you're soaking your nuts and seeds. If you're an individual that has inflammation already going, we all have inflammation, but if you're in a, in, a, in an elevated state of inflammation, you want to soak your nuts and seeds to release those uh, phytonutrients so that you can utilize the fats, the essential fatty acids that are in your natural nuts and seeds. When you soak those, they help to activate the enzymes so that you can actually break down those omegas, which are so important with regulating the inflammatory process. So if I were to distill it down, I mean, you know, we use food lists and grocery lists and, and have a lot of fun with it, but basically lots of fruits and lots of complex carbs the first couple of days, heavier in the alkaline vegetables and the leaner proteins for the last three days, at, for the next two days. And then we use a lot of the healthy fats. What we find just like, you know, 
the body cycles between rest and restoration. And if you can mimic, anytime you can mimic something that naturally and innately happens in the body with food, you can evoke a quicker change in the positive direction. So, so that's how we play with that. And, and, and that's a little more complex. Even if you just rotate your fruits and you just rotate your vegetables, you're gonna help by delivering a biodiverse nutrient plan throughout the week. I don't want you doing chicken and broccoli every day. Never, we never recommend the same food every day. <laughs> uh, yes. One, uh, I, before I, I go to next question, I want to ask all participants, please fill out the survey, which was sent to you together with a uh, link for this Zoom. Uh, we, and after we finish, after last meeting on Monday, we will send you another link with survey. Please, it's very short survey, one page, just answer the questions. We will appreciate your help. How to get kids, teens with chronic nausea to, to get used to variety of diets and foods? Any insight? Right. So we, we look at why is there chronic nausea, right? So we look at secretion in the parotid gland, right? Where we, we first start our digestion. Nausea can a lot of times have things to do with the gallbladder. It can be if, if it, especially I call them my little nut nuts, especially when our kids um, are what we call hypochlorhydric. They don't have a good acid production in the stomach. Um, we can have that with SIBO where they have small intestine intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or we can have it where they're, the lower part is we're trunking down the GI tract where they don't have a good healthy gut bug uh, ratio and or they have an overgrowth of candida or candidiasis. So, so we want to get, you know, the, the kids to eat, but if we can maybe create some homeostasis in, in the gut bugs, we do this really fun test and it's at home and the kids love to do it because it's kind of cool. We do what's called a lemon challenge test. And basically I'm gonna give you, I can give you guys the links, whatever, but basically you test the, the pH of your saliva with like a nitrazine strip. Do not put it in your mouth. It's a nitrazine strip. You put it on a plastic spoon and you spit in the spoon and you test your pH. And then you take a bite of a lemon. And as we know, lemon is very acidic, very acid. So if we look at the pH scale, anything under a seven is acidic. Anything above, I'm gonna give a little chemistry class, basic is a basic or alkaline, right? And we would say, okay, this is a digestive reserve. I'm gonna take a bite of a lemon. Of course, when I spit the next time, it's going to be very acidic because I just had a, about a 4.0 in my, my mouth. But how quickly, and the kids, again, we've done this in my kids' science classes in, in uh, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I think we even did it with uh, freshmen in high school one time. Um, how quickly does your digestive reserve rebound and create a homeostasis to where you were at before? It's a really fun thing to do. It's really easy. And you know, with kids, it can give an indication of what foods might be helpful to stimulate digestion. So nausea is, I mean, obviously if we have, you know, parasitic involvement, um, if we have hypochondria or low stomach acid, there's a lot of reasons why and a comprehensive digestive stool analysis can be amazing on kids. But it's also fun to get them involved in the science a little bit and look at their digestive reserve. I've seen it happen with kids that have um, uh, extractions, dental extractions, root um, uh, wisdom teeth extractions, braces, Sometimes just the orthodontics or the bite being off can cause a lot of nausea. And so things like cranial sacral therapy can be very beneficial. Getting the kid involved in the why this is going on in the body can be really, really key in my opinion. And then, and then you know, herbs and spices. Man, I will, kids that don't eat oatmeal, I'll add, you know, cardamom, nutmeg, cinnamon, or I'll go the other direction and do peppermint. Or uh, even I have a kid that we had to get some, um, red chili and peppermint, get it, get it kind of that spicy aspect of it to get his body to actually be able to tolerate the complex carbohydrate in an oatmeal. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. In general, uh, meats are more inflammatory, should be avoided. Not agree with it, but it's a question. Say this one more time. Are meats more inflammatory and should be avoided? So 
you know, meats are a form of protein, right? Certain proteins are harder to digest and harder to break down in the body. There are individuals, there is no sweeping, unfortunately and fortunately, we are too biodynamic and biodiverse in order to make an absolute about anything. When our bodies break down protein, we go in different aspects of meat, right? So lamb, for example, can be much easier to digest. Buffalo can be much easier to digest. Wild game is way easier to digest than commercial raised cattle or beef. So there's a couple tricks that you can do. So for example, if we use beef in our household, I use a lot of bromelain or papain in the form of, I keep the core of my um, pineapple and I stick it in the freezer. And then if I do beef, I'll either grate it while I cook my beef. You can also use horseradish as another good one, but it does uh, affect the flavor. Or if I'm doing a roast, I will take the core of my pineapple and put it into the roast while it's cooking. That can help you break things down. Culinary herbs can be super, super important too when you're eating a, a heavy protein to not create acidity in the body. So adding things like parsley, cilantro, arugula is a very good gastro herb that you can add with those foods. Even if you don't like the flavor of those, but you cook with them and then take them off afterwards, those phytonutrients can help the breakdown process significantly. So I'm, I'm not opposed to meat. Everybody's body is different. I have everything from vegans to, you know, you name it. And it's, it's about creating the ideal situation that's going to promote the results that everybody deserves. Yes, some amino acid what we need to use we actually come only from animal product and some vitamins right. we uh, get in because we eat animal products. What about kefir in yogurt? What the, so, what the preferences? Right. So what we're looking at is we're looking at both pre and so the question was about kefir and yogurt. I will say most commercially uh, sold yogurts don't have enough pre and probiotics in them to make a medicinal impact. It's great for marketing. The labels look really sexy, but they don't do a darn thing for your health. So I'm not a big proponent to suggest that individuals run out and go grab a yogurt and have that as a snack. Um, the kefir or the fermented uh, process does promote more of the pre and probiotics. So think about this, prebiotics are the food for the good gut bugs, the probiotics in the body. So you're kind of, you know, giving the bugs to the body, you're inoculating the body, but you're also packing them a picnic lunch when you have prebiotics so that they have something to eat once they've been re-inoculated and they can grow and flourish. Um, you know, I love cultured foods like salsa. I make cultured salsa all the time. Um, and I add it like if I'm eating eggs and peppers and things like that, again, having had an autoimmune disorder and with antiplatelet antibodies, which is what I have, the prostaglandins that are pro-inflammatory, you know, inhibited me until I got it under control from being able to conceive from uh, not having miscarriage. You know, there was a lot of things that were going on in my body when my pro-inflammatory hormones were out of control, but I love salsa and I love peppers. So I just have to make sure that I add, add and layer culinary herbs so that my body can actually release the phytonutrients that make them spicy, that can actually purify the blood and promote health. So it's, so it's only a little bit of food science sometimes. I'm glad and, that, and being, uh, and being, and being, yeah, being curious, being in awe of your body, especially when it's struggling. Like, what is it trying to tell me? I'm glad that our participant, our, our patient asked this question. It's exactly very good question. Uh, yes. I'm, this is how I prescribe probiotic. I will recommend have your probiotic in the evening with a cup of kefir. It's like you're giving the bacteria and a breakfast for bacteria. Really nice yes. questions. How to deal with no appetite? Forcing food on the body, the food is rejected and loss of appetite, practically lifelong adaptation and the problem. Any right insight? Yeah, so, so a couple things that I would say is um, small portions frequently, right? And also very nutrient dense. So every time you, you select or choose something, we kind of don't, we call in our community, we call we don't want to waste the volume, right? You know, kiwi is like the new, most nutrient dense food on the planet, right? We want to, if we can have to stomach food that we're not really um, looking to be palatable. The other thing that we've done a lot of times is um, 
you know, all of our senses are activated, especially when we don't have appetite. So if there's any kind of smell or scent that you really enjoy, whether it's, you know, I don't use perfumes personally, but if it's an aromatherapy or it's a person, a particular, like a sweet, sweet, you know, the smell of chocolate, I don't care what it is, but if you can evoke that while you're eating, a lot of times that can override an individual that's having nausea. We do a lot of that when we have individuals that are, you know, going through cancer therapies, maybe they're on, you know, a, a medication that's making them nauseous, um, or an individual that, um, is, um, you know, like, like, I, I'm not sure what's going on with this particular individual, but an individual that's dealing with an inflammatory uh, system. Now, I will say appetite itself is there's a very strong hormonal component with our adipocytes or our fat cells. So you can work on appetite by doing things that are not food related, like dry skin brushing or infrared sauna -ing. that can help you increase blood flow into the adipocytes or the fat cells of the body and can help actually regulate appetite. There's another, what we call success booster that we do is, I don't know if you guys have done any alternate nostril breathing. I, I you know, I can, whatever you guys want, I can give you links to anything, but um, that can really help integrate kind of that, that hunger and feel full hormone uh, axis in the brain and can help with appetite. So we, we, again, we do this with a lot of our little peanuts, a lot of our kids that are, um, you know, not, uh, don't have a strong appetite or what we call failure to thrive. And so we do a lot of the dry skin brushing, a lot of the tactical stimulus, a lot of the sense, sensory stimulus also, and that can help uh, repattern the, the gut brain axis so that the body has a pleasurable experience when it's going through the food process. And, and, and really try a variety of those because it's a very, very uh, tough one. I'm sorry you're going through that. Hi, Lee. I can ask you one more question because we're running out of time. We're trying to of course. make this, this uh, recording and activity short. We do not extend so much energy. Uh, you said to avoid grains, but is quinoa? No, you don't have to avoid grains. Not, not at all. I'm sorry if that came across. I, I saw that question. Let me clarify. I love grains. I just don't like wheat and I don't like corn. So steel cut oats is phenomenal. Quinoa is, is got a really nice natural protein content that's fairly easy to digest, especially if you add quinoa with some of the culinary herbs. Sage is phenomenal with quinoa. It can really help. Like, so when I have a lot of my professional athletes that are vegan in nature, we'll use quinoa and sage to get the uptake of the protein really efficiently. The other um, aspect is things like wild rice. Remember, wild rice is not a grain. So so, you know, people will say I'm grain sensitive. Wild rice is actually a seed. Um, and so a lot of people that don't tolerate grains because of the blood sugar issue, you can make sure that you, you know, play with grain like feel, but you can maybe do wild rice. If you're an individual that uses grains like brown rice or oatmeal and notice that it makes a, 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 any kind of disruption in, um, your blood sugar, add a healthy fat to it. So a lot of times with oatmeal, we'll add a raw nut butter, we'll add uh, coconut uh, oil to it. You can even add olive oil to it if you'd like. Um, my favorite is I love raw pecan butter, black cherries and oatmeal. And it just is so good for my inflammation and it's so good for my blood sugar. It's a great way to kick off the day and it freezes really well too. So thank you so much. I hope that and helps, I'm, absolutely. I'm